Hello, and welcome to Interabang Chats. My name is Lori Feathers. I'm the book buyer at Interabang, and I'm really thrilled to have with us today Kristen Radke, whose uh, graphic novel, Seek You, A Journey Through American Loneliness, will be published on July 2nd. Kristen, welcome. Thank you so much. It was great to talk with you, Lori. Um, Kristen is one of the oldest author friends of Interabang Books. <laughs> we had, I think, our first or very second event ever with Kristen um, in May or June of 2017 uh, for your first graphic novel, Imagine Wanting Only This. And that was even before our store opened. So yeah, I remember I have these photos of like walking around the store, like, and like, you know, you got y'all explaining to me like where things were gonna be, it was so cool. But you probably know that that store existed and then it was blown away by a tornado. So uh, <laughs> we're in a different location entirely now, um, but uh, the store is still going and blowing and it's so nice to see you again. You too. Um, I was really very moved by this book. Um, and you say in the preface to the book that, that you started writing this in 2016, well before we, ever had a glimmer in our eye or a glimmer is probably too optimistic of a word but the foreboding that there was going to be a global pandemic kind of coming upon us and i wondered if you could just kind of talk to us a, a little bit about how it has kind of impacted the book to have a book about loneliness coming out now as we're starting to see, at least in the United States, um, a reopening of the country after a period of total, almost total shut-in. Yeah, I, you know, I mean, the, obviously this was a really lonely time for a lot of people, the pandemic. I think that the pandemic was a sort of particular kind of loneliness because it was like an imposed isolation. And there, there was almost like, I, I don't know, I think every community experienced differently, but there was also a kind of solidarity in that of like, we were all in this really difficult thing together. So I feel like that's a different kind of, that, that's different than some of the things I was investigating in the book about like chronic loneliness or about like American ideologies about loneliness. But I think it did remind us how much we really need each other. So I, I, I I'm interested in kind of thinking it through that lens, but I definitely, um, you know, I had a lot of conversations with my agent and editor about should we, should I talk about COVID in the book and all those things. And in the end, we decided to, we didn't really necessarily want to make it a pandemic book. Uh, the book is, um, I don't know, I thought of it in some places as a memoir, because you talk about your own life and, and your family. Um, but there's an awful lot of research in the book as well. So I thought we just kind of take some of the big areas and, and themes that you talk about in the book. And um, the book begins a little bit of a visit with your uncle and talking about some things that that you hadn't known about your father. Do you want to talk about that a little bit with us? Yeah, so I the book is called Seek You and uh, in amateur radio, if you want to speak to somebody that you don't know, if you want to just like call out to anyone, it's called a CQ call, the letters C and Q. And then over time, people sort of called it a CQ call because it sounds so so similar. And so when my dad was a kid, he I didn't know this until uh, you know I was a little bit older. But when he was a kid, he was really obsessed with ham radio, and he would call out like he would call out all night. He would make CQ calls kind of all night. And I thought this was a really beautiful thing for like a 10, 11, 12 year old to do because it's about a desire to make connection. And I, 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 it reminded me so much of, you know, I came of age in like very early internet at that same time. And so I was like in late night chat rooms, like chatting with someone in New Zealand or wherever. And, and it was probably a kind of loneliness that drives you to, to seek those relationships. Yeah. Um, you then kind of turn to, um, your upbringing in the Midwest and being moved or moving yourself rather, I guess, to New York City and kind of how that changed your perception of being in a community and kind of having just a flood of people kind of at you all the time in public. Um, tell us a little bit about that. 
Well, you know, there is this kind of like nuisance quality about living in a congested place. Like you just get, it's just like annoying and like you're hot all the time, even when you're cold and like, it's just, everything is just like kind of frustrating and gross. And so you can find a way to really be annoyed by that. I think, I mean, it's interesting, like reading those passages now when we have spent so long away from crowds that I almost have like a nostalgia for that gross feeling. But I think that when we see, you know, in New York and in major cities, particularly, I think cities with like a bus system or a subway, when you get to see someone who's like in transit for a long time, you can kind of observe them in a way you wouldn't in a normal uh, other in a, di in a different setting. Um, it's like a, it's an interesting opportunity to, to see each other and, and kind of observe our habits. And that can be kind of like this beautiful thing. I think like it's easy to sort of see all those things as really lonely when you see someone who's like alone on the subway or alone on the bus or, you know, who's like eating alone or something like that. But I think also what I came to realize is that I was often projecting loneliness in those moments. And I was just sort of like mirroring maybe what I was feeling at the time. The, um, the social history of community and isolation is something that I thought was just really remarkable, particularly, and, and I want to get to this um, a, a bit later, but the fact that you have kind of um, coupled your prose with some really remarkable images, because this is a graphic novel. Um, but one of the things that you talk about is how the world kind of shifted a bit after World War II. And we started seeing television sets and TV dinners. And suddenly, um, a, a lot of our world became what was happening within the walls of our homes. Mm -hmm. And you talk about how that kind of affected people's um, kind of need to feel part of the community. And it was really interesting, the research that you did, and you talk about it here, about how the laugh track got started. Do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, the laugh track is such an interesting phenomenon. Like I, you know, it's such, it's sort of like this capsule in time in a certain way. It's like a, a particular kind of sitcom television. It speaks to a sort of particular kind of attitude that viewers were looking for. But I, you know, it was the laugh track sort of came into public consciousness when people started watching TV alone. Whereas before, maybe you'd go to the movie theater or something like that, or you'd go to a play, then people started to sort of engage in entertainment often alone. And the suburbs had a lot to, you know, those, those um, invention, you know, like the invention of the suburbs and the invention of the television, you know, the, obviously this didn't have anything to do with each other, but, but the relationship between the two, I think was quite strong in, um, in, in being like, well, I don't need to go seek someone out tonight. I have, you know, I have entertainment at home. So our fam maybe our family units and sometimes were, did become stronger because we spent more time with each other, but we need more than just a family unit. We need a whole community. We all rely on each other you know, to survive and to thrive. So the laugh track, um, the first, it was actually on a radio show and uh, there was a guest who came on who was a comedian who was like very raunchy and they decided, okay, we can't air this. This is like not appropriate for a station, but they had re the recordings of the laughter and they were like, man, this laughter is so great. And so uh, like a, a few weeks later, they had a guest on the show who like wasn't very funny. And so they just spliced in the, like the sort of raucous laughter in those places. And then they were like, Hey, this, this works pretty well. So then there was like a laugh, a laugh machine that would like, you could crank it and it would make these different kinds of sounds of laughter, laughter. And, or you would, um, you know, a lot of these things were filmed in front of a live studio audience. And then they would kind of, they would call it, they called it sweetening when they would add an additional laughter and those sounds. And I think what's interesting about the laugh track is that it, for me, at least when I was a kid, the laugh, when I was, if I was watching a sitcom, the laugh track taught me humor in a certain way. Like it taught me, oh, that was a joke. What's the joke? Like, how is it constructed? What does that mean? Um, in a way that I probably would, it wouldn't have made sense. It was almost like a guide, you know, but that, but also it's a way of making yourself feel like you're um, engaging in something that's like a public or shared act rather than a solitary one. And, and you, you talk about um, how we kind of get to feel like these people on TV um, as we're sitting alone in front of um, the screen and maybe having our dinner, how they, they kind of become, we, we get emotionally tied to them. And, and you, you talk about um, your experience as um, 
as a young girl and maybe teenage girl kind of watching friends and being like very upset when these programs would would end because you you felt a real connection to the people on the screen. Yeah, and television was such a different thing before streaming obviously because if like you missed a show that was it. Like if right. you if you if you miss like the seven o'clock slot, like you just wouldn't know what happened. Uh, you know, you'd have to maybe get like a you know if you didn't tape it, call a friend. Know. Yeah, exactly. Like there was no <laughs> agony like realizing like your tape hadn't recorded. You know, especially I think when you're a kid and you're like learning. I mean, storytelling is so important when you're a kid. Still, like to this day, the books that have had you know I, I've never had a reading experience the way even books that I really loved the way I did when I was a kid because. When I was a kid, I was like trying to understand the world through literature because I hadn't experienced any of it. So, and of course we still do that in adulthood too, but there is this sort of energy to it as a child. And I felt like that with, with TV too. Um, so it's like, you could just turn on a channel and suddenly like your show isn't on anymore, you know, and like some new show of full people you don't know is there. And it's, it feels like, it feels like a death or something, but then, you know, you become to love a new set of characters too. I want, I do want to talk about your, your drawings and um, I, I don't, it would be interesting for me to know and probably for our listeners, um, how does it work for you? Um, do you write some text and then you try to couple it with pictures or do the pictures come first? Usually the text comes first. I usually will write some kind of script, not for the whole book, not for a whole project, but for, you know, sort of like a moment like uh, or, or a, of an idea. So like I might start writing at the laugh track section, for example, which is a sm which is a small part of a larger section. I'm not doing the whole section at once, but it's kind of like, okay, this is an idea I have. How can I then start drawing out around it? And I try to um, put off the drawing for as long as I can, just because the project changes so much with the writing. And so maybe the style of the drawings will change or maybe the structure um, and it's just because drawing takes so long, I try also not to have to redraw things like, you know, 10 times, which doesn't always, I don't always succeed at that. Um, so I kind of, I like to work back and forth in that way. I think that the, the sort of the relationship between text and image is most interesting when you can kind of bounce back and forth between the two, because they inform each other. Like I can think I need a certain amount of space for an image, but then I might realize that I actually need three images there or that something is moving a lot slower, faster than I would have thought. I, I think that um, maybe, correct me if I'm wrong, I think that maybe you, you've you published um, an essay or two, or maybe a short story or two without, mm -hmm. just text without drawings. And I, so is that, does that feel like that's working a totally different muscle in your head? Is that more difficult for you to do? It's, it's, I mean, writing is always difficult. I think like writing to me is harder than drawing. I mean, drawing is a lot of labor. It's a, it's probably more labor than writing because it takes me longer, but it's not as intellectually draining as writing. Like I have to be very present when I'm writing, but I can, you know, like have a podcast on in the background or something like that, or like a sitcom on in the background and, and I can still draw. Um, and I can do, I can draw when I'm tired and I definitely can't write when I'm tired. <laughs> you know, like there, there's, there's just no way. So, I mean, I think when I write, I mean, I can't, when I, when I started writing and when I went, was in graduate school, I was just writing at straight essays. I wasn't, I wasn't including any images for a while and it was fine. Like there, it's similar to the way, you know, but I think over time I used to think in paragraphs and now I think in panels kind of, you know, like I'm thinking about the relationship between text and image right away. So when I write something in all prose, I also have to write so many more words <laughs> than I have to in with graphics, which is, that's the really the agonizing part. As a, as a bookstore owner and, and bookseller, I find um, there, are, there are many more um, graphic books, a quality literary graphic books being published now than ever before but I still find it a challenge. There still seems to be an initial hurdle that I have to go through to get someone, uh, especially an adult, to kind of um, embrace the format. And it occurs to me also that, you know, I think that we kind of try to clump everything that's maybe not comic strips into kind of a graphic novel. And your book is graphic, but I, I wouldn't necessarily call it a novel. Uh, what are your thoughts on kind of 
Yeah. I mean, the naming of, of comics gets like really confused. And I think that's where we kind of run into trouble. I mean, like if you look at like the New York Times bestseller list for comics, it's like manga, children's, and then all the literary stuff too, and superhero stuff and, you know, all the different genre stuff. So it's like a huge, massive category. I mean, it's like, it's re- there are so many readers within there that, that don't kind of overlap, you know, right. they're specific things so I I find I find it just to be all kind of annoying like I like to I like to just say you know I like to say I'll sometimes I'll say graphic narratives or something like that but I like I at the end of the day I don't totally care what anybody calls it (laughs) but I I think I think you're right about that initial hurdle I think it is it's probably something that I felt too when I started reading comics or graphic narratives because it is a different way of reading and you have to get used to moving between text and image, even in a kind of literal way. You have to, your eyes have to get used to that. And you have to figure out your like what do you what method you prefer? Do you want to look at the image first? Do you want to read the text first? You know, does that change based on the image and text? Does it change based on the page? Do you have a rule? Like there are just certain things that you have to get used to. And so I understand that early resistance. I also think that there is sometimes like a bias, like as if to say this isn't serious or you know, this isn't a real this isn't a, this isn't a like quote unquote capital N novel. And isn't that, isn't that um, so ironic? Because when you think of um, movies, Mm -hmm. I mean, so many of the foreign movies have, you know, subtext or subtitles down below. And that has the impression of being like, oh, a really serious, a serious (laughs) movie or a complicated movie, you know, but it seems kind of just the opposite when we're talking about books. It must just be because of comics. It must be because people think of like super superheroes or like peanuts, you know, in, in the newspaper. I think people think probably have certain biases or like Archie comics or something like that. Although I do kind of like Archie comics. Um, <laughs> I think it's obviously a great, a great strip, but I think it is sort of like that, that massive category. Um, but it's just like, you know, if someone likes fantasy novels, they might not like a, a sort of like light beach read. You know, there's so there's so much variety between those two things or like a, a horror book versus like a romance novel versus a, you know, a, a, a high literary novel. Like there's all of that variety in graphic work too. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the part of your book that kind of was a real sucker punch in the gut for me was your um your discussion of the scientific studies and work of harry harlow Mm -hmm. um in the 20th century it was really hard to read about some of those studies that he he performed on on i guess it was mostly rhesus monkeys but um so tell me kind of how you decided to put those sections in the book and kind of where you're looking at that topic kind of led you. Yeah, I mean, so that's a, it's interesting that section, my, my editor and I had a long conversation about that. He was like, this is, you know, this is difficult to read. Are you sure I don't want to pare it back? And I just felt so strongly about it because I just became so fascinated by him because he became kind of like this sort of like mad scientist Type. So, you know, Harry Harlow is famous for his study of rhesus monkeys. He did something called the surrogate mother study where he separated uh, baby m- monkeys from their, from their mothers at birth and then put them in cages with um, two inanimate fake mothers. And one was made out of wire and one was made out of cloth. And the wire mother dispensed milk and the cloth mother didn't do anything. And the point of that was to prove whether definitively whether or not it was true that babies only loved their mothers because they provided them with food which was kind of the common understanding at the time and they found that to be completely untrue like the monkey much preferred the sort of um the cuddly monkey that provided nothing versus like the scary wire monkey that actually could nourish them and from there you know so that really changed the way that parenting happened i mean it had like profound profound consequences throughout science because at the time science didn't even acknowledge or recognize that love exists, exists. They would use the word proximity. And Harry kind of set out to prove that love was real in a certain way. But he got in the process, he became, he became kind of unhinged. Like in the, in the process, he, he wanted to prove that love was real through by imposing more and more kind of horrific 
circumstances onto monkeys. And monkeys are, you know, highly intelligent animals. They're they're wildly similar to um, humans in the way that they experience emotions and and pain. And it was, it, you know, it was brutal. The the things that he, you know, he put a monkey in complete isolation for over a year. Um, and then just observe what would happen and the, you know, cut to the results are, are horrible. Um, and he just, it was like, he couldn't, he, he couldn't take the experiment far enough. He just wanted to see kind of how far he could push it. But meanwhile, in his life, he's getting more and more depressed. He's spending a lot of time in um, mental institutions and uh, his, his personal life is falling apart. And so I, I became kind of interested in this idea that he was kind of mirroring in the monkeys or trying to create in the monkeys the way he felt. And so I tried to have, you know, I think for, I should, should just should just say for the record that I think Harry is a complete monster. He was, you know, very sadistic man, but I, I, I thought, what would it be like to sort of render him write about someone who I think is, did evil things? What, if, what would it would be like to write about them with love or with empathy? And so that's what I tried to do. Yeah. I thought it was really interesting how you you did very much, and I, I could see the parallel as I was that as I was reading it. You know, he as as his experiments get darker and darker, he seems to be getting darker and darker, and just going down this 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 spiral himself. Um, and it, it it was it was hard to to read, but I think that you know. I don't know. What do you think? Do you think that we would have continued on this path of thinking about love and parenting in kind of the wrong way for longer had he not done what he did? Good question. I mean, that you know, this was around the age of like Skinner's box and the, you know, it was about like, you're not supposed to touch your kids. You're not supposed to, to physically co sort of comfort your kids when they're upset. You're not supposed to, to really be in much contact because parents were afraid that coddling would kind of make your kids soft or, or that it would spread disease and it might, it might kill them. So I, you know, I have no idea that that's a really interesting question. Look, there's no doubt that his contributions to psychology were profound, but I'm sure that there were other ways to, to arrive there. I mean, it like the, sort of, I think the, the surrogate monkey study well, it had cruel elements to it. Seemed to me, with it had a specific goal, and later, later his with his later studies, when it sort of escalated, when they got darker and darker, it seemed like even to his colleagues that goal became unclear. Like it was just like he was. It, it almost just became this fascination of like, how far can I go? How far can I push a living thing? And so for there for that, I I mean, I'm, it's hard for me to even quite understand what we've learned from that process or why that you know, ultimately was an important investigation, but I think it is extremely interesting the way he kind of was driven to that point or he drove himself to that point. Yeah. Um, one of the things that I think that, that you really illuminate in the book is um, maybe this distinction between aloneness and loneliness and the stigma and shame that kind of attaches to loneliness in our culture and kind of loneliness being equated with being left out or um, or being excluded. And um, obviously, you know, with um, the proliferation of bullying that we we've seen over the decades and the attempts in schools and even in, in grown up people's workplaces to kind of stop that kind of behavior. Um, I, I wonder, you know, kind of how far you think that we, we kind of need to go as a society to kind of look at loneliness in the right and in a constructive and healthy way. I think we have a really long way to go. I mean, I think actually America has not at all confronted its its problem of loneliness. Like the former U.S. Surgeon General has called it one of America's most pressing health risks, and um, sociologists say it's going to be an epidemic by 2030. And America isn't the loneliest country in the world, but it's up there. Um, the UK also has really high rates of loneliness. Japan has really high rates of loneliness. It's it generally like the wealthier a country, the 
with some exceptions in Scandinavia, the, the lonelier the country. And I think a lot of that has to do with physical proximity. Um, you know, it's a mark of having made it if you can afford your own apartment or your own house or, a, you know, a big yard that separates you from, from other people. That's kind of like part of the, this sort of like myth or ethos of the American dream is like space from other people. And cer certainly there's a, there's a world in which that really works well for some people. Some people like a lot of solitude. But I think it also does separate us from each other, literally and emotionally. So I think we, I think we have a ton of work to do there. I think we also we fail to remember there's like this emphasis on self sufficiency in America that I think is um, dangerous because it's not real. Like we actually, there's no such thing as self sufficiency. We need each other to survive. Like we can't be our own doctors. We can't probably farm every single thing that we eat. Like we can't, you know, there, we can't probably make all of our own clothes or, or, you know, weave the fabric to make our own clothes. Like, it's just not a possible thing. Like we, we, as human beings, we're built to rely on each other and to need each other. So I think when we live in a, you know, an age where everything is convenient and you can get something delivered to your door that day, but not, not have to really speak to anybody else, it creates this illusion that we're sort of in it alone or that we can take care of things ourselves, And we really can't. One of the terms that you use in the book, and I had never heard it before, so I don't know whether you coined it or not, but is skin hunger. And um, I'm a big hugger. Um, I guess I, I always have been, I'm not quite sure why, but um, COVID was horrible for me. <laughs> you know, I just, I really, I really missed um, touching people, even if it's, you know, grabbing someone's hand or, um, and, you know, in the last few weeks when things have been opening up and I've been traveling a little bit, you know, I've gone and seen some friends and they're like, wow, you're the first person that's hugged me that's not in my immediate family since COVID. And I'm vaccinated, I'll just say that. But um, there is this, I think for maybe for everyone, maybe some people have more elevated need for it than others. Um, but I think that there's there's got to be some um, some repercussions of what yeah. we've just lived through in the past 15 months, over and above what you're saying in terms of our country's preparedness to deal with the epidemic of loneliness even before COVID. Mm -hmm. But um, what do you see as kind of some of the, the the challenges as we're trying to look? to the future, you know, kind of psychologically that we're going to need to, to overcome after this, this really traumatic period we've been through? I think we need to really overcorrect. Like, I think we need to throw all of our efforts into connecting with each other to, to like, you know, there's that gum commercial where everyone's just like rolling around in the park, like <laughs> hugging. And I do kind of feel like that, you know, I feel like there is this, we sort of just need to all be in it together physically. You know, and hugs are, you know, hugging is actually very, um, you know, I talked to a lot of touch therapists for the book and touching like physical touches, if we need it to survive, we like our immune systems start to fail when no one touches you. And it, and that doesn't have to be romantic at all. It's just a way to communicate like, hey, I'm here. I care about you. We're, um, I'm, I'm another human person who, you know, you matter. Those things are really important. Um, like scientists have discovered, like if you hug your, if you have a partner or a friend in the morning, you hug for a minute a day, like you perform better at work, you know, things like that. Like that it's really, it's sort of beyond our control. It's biological. So I think when we ignore our biological impulses in those ways, that's, that gets really dangerous. And so when we had to stay away from each other to keep each other safe during the pandemic, I think now we really need to pay attention to all those things that we missed and work hard, I think, to reconnect in those ways. Um, and not just with our most intimate friends and family, but with, um, you know, acquaintances and sort of like the middle, uh, the middle tier. Uh, some of the research I did was about the tiers of community and that you have like your sort of inner circle, like your closest friends and family. And then you have like this middle ring that's like, you know, uh, in the, in the, uh, you know, it might've been like you're someone you go to church with or someone you see every, every day at the grocery store and you strike up a conversation or like your neighbor over the fence or something like that. They may not be your closest friends, but they're kind of imperative in that way. And then you have like the acquaintances and things on the outside. And one of the problems with 
America uh, is that that middle ring is sort of dropping away because things like clubs are kind of disappearing, like, you know, bridge clubs or something like that, or like the PTA, you know, like people aren't sort of involved in those ways anymore. But I think one, one of the things I find hopeful about COVID is that I think that middle ring kind of did start emerging again. Like we had mutual aid groups and stuff like that that were formed. And, and we were kind of working together in a lot of neighborhoods to, to help each other survive. And so I think, I hope that, I really, really hope that that remains and that we realize uh, what a necessary service that is for each other. Yeah, I, um, I know that during, during the, the pandemic, um, we moved our in-store book club to Zoom. And mm -hmm. in a lot of ways, that was really, um, that was really fulfilling um, because we were able to bring in some people that didn't live locally. Um, and it kind of was a getting together every month and seeing each other in a very lonely time. But um, starting in June um, of this year, um, you know, we're back in the store again and we're, we're back getting together. We've had our first book club meeting um, and it just feels so good. It just feels so good. Um, and, and bookstores are, I guess, a little bit selfish about this uh, to be able to put books in people's hands, you know, yeah. and not just talk totally. about <laughs> Yeah. I mean, come on, like the bookstore, like the virtual events. I heard very early from bookseller friends that it's like, sure, people will come to these events, but then they buy the book on Amazon or something like that. They don't buy it from the store. And it's like the uh, putting on a book event is such a labor of love. It's And it's an opportunity for a community to gather. Like bookstores are community gathering spaces and there's not that many of those left. So it's just, I'm so glad you you're all are open again and, and creating that, that space. Yeah, it was really, um, I, I don't think that anyone that I talked to was saying, oh, I wish we would go back to, to the Zooms. Um, you know, it's, it's kind of a pain to fight traffic to get there. And, you know, it can be inconvenient to have to leave work early, yeah. but there's still, I think we all so much more appreciate the, the fellowship of just being together in a group and being able to look into each other's eyes and to, and to talk one-on-one -on -one and to touch a hand or to give a hug. And it's, um, and it's the conversation can be so much more organic. Like you have those sort of like, um, in between moments where you can actually connect with each other. Yeah, no, absolutely. Well, Kristen, I can't really think of a more important book for, all of us right now. Oops, I need to turn it around. In in the world, really, than than your your narrative about the social history of of loneliness and um, kind of a bit of your life and how you felt, you know, personally lonely at times. I, I think it's it's such a universal feeling, but I'm really I'm really so happy that someone like you has addressed why the stigma and the shame around loneliness is something that's that's just not counterproductive and really not something that you know that we should really even feel because we all we've all felt it um more or less one time or another and and some people you know kind of consistently yeah for sure thank you that's so nice of you to say yeah i mean i guess my hope is that we all recognize that loneliness is a feeling that is meant to propel us back to each other. So we just have to learn to listen to it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Kristen, and very, very uh, warm wishes. It was so nice to see you again, and good luck with the book. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Take care. Thank you, Laurie. Thank you.